I mentioned to the children that the Bible is our instruction book. I love the, the uh, acronym that someone has come up with Bible, uh, B-I-B-L-E, Basic Instructions Before Leaving Earth. We won't need them once we leave Earth. We'll have face-to-face -face contact with God. But he does give us these basic instructions that we all need, whether we're going back to school or whether we're just simply facing a new day. So this morning we want to look at just a little tiny snippet from these instructions from the book of Colossians. I'm going to be reading from chapter 1, verses 9 through 14. These are some of the opening words to this church at Colossa from the Apostle Paul. For this reason, since the day we heard about you, we have not stopped praying for you and asking God to fill you with the knowledge of his will through all spiritual wisdom and understanding. And we pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might, so that you might have great endurance and patience, and joyfully giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This is our instruction book for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, in the, in the stillness and quiet of this place today, we know that you are present. And we ask you to move among us and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you would indeed um, inspire us with these words. Teach us, mold us, and shape us more and more into the likeness of Christ so that we can truly live out your instructions and be faithful to our calling. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. An Army Airborne Ranger was learning to parachute. The sergeant barked out his instructions, as he often would, in an order, as an order. Jump when you are told to jump. Count to ten, then pull the ripcord. If the first chute doesn't open, pull the second ripcord. I'd be running out the door at that point. When you land, a truck will take you back to the post. Well, the plane got over the landing zone and the soldier was told to jump, which he did. He counted to ten and he pulled the first ripcord, but nothing happened. So following instructions, he pulled the second ripcord. Again, nothing happened. As he, he was right, as he spiraled downward at a very fast pace, he could be heard muttering and grumbling to himself in his radio, oh, this is just great, and I bet the truck won't be there for us either. <laughs> as long as I taught school, each August or September brought with it both excitement and at the same time a little twinge of fear. It was a new beginning. Even if I had been doing it for years, each new school year brought with it its own set of possibilities and challenges. At times I kind of felt like the paratrooper, standing at the door of the plane, about to jump and just praying that all the instructions that I'd been given during those teacher work days would be correct and that everything would work out as it was supposed to. The thing is, we all need instructions. No matter what job we're in or what task we're asked to do, the good news for us today, as I've already said to the kids, is that we have some wonderful and 100% trustworthy instructions. And they are not just for those who are beginning a new school year, but for all of us as we begin and live out each new day of our lives. God's word is full of instructions for us. Our job is to take God's word and to do as the psalmist says in Psalm 119. 
I will seek you with all my heart. Do not let me stray from your commands. I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin against you. I meditate on your precepts and consider your ways. I delight in your decrees. I will not neglect your word. Our passage of scripture for today is one that has some wonderful words of instruction for us. It comes, as I already mentioned to you, from Paul's letter to the church of Colossa, a church that was facing many challenges to their faith. There were false teachers roaming all around them, threatening to pull them from their newfound belief and trust in Jesus Christ. Each day was new for them, and it also held new threats and challenges, just like our days do. And so they needed to hear and to be reminded to stand firm on God's word. Each day, and particularly as we face new beginnings, like a new school year, there are many things that could go wrong. We all know that. There are many things out there that have the potential to threaten our faith. We all know that. So we must take to heart the words of encouragement and instruction that were given like these to the Colossians, for they are God's word to all of us today, to students, to teachers, to staff, and to this whole community of faith. God-given instructions to help us prepare for the school of life. So let's take a few minutes and look at the instructions that we find here from God. I believe there are three in these verses, and we're actually going to take them in the reverse order in which they come in the letter. First of all, we are taught to, or told to, joyfully give thanks to God. Listen again to verse 12. Joyfully give thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in the kingdom of light. Now giving thanks is not something we've not, I mean we've heard of this over and over and over again. I mean from the time we were little kids we were taught to give thanks before our meals, to give thanks as we went to bed at night. But sometimes I think when we grow up and the problems of life come in at us, we, we get a little sour. We get a little tainted by all the negativity that is around us. And so we forget to give thanks. God's word is full of reminders to us and calls to us to give thanks. From Psalm 100, enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. From Psalm 95, let us come before the Lord with thanksgiving and extol him with music and song. And if you were at Swepsonville yesterday, and maybe even outside, you might have heard a lot of extolling with music and song to God. There was a lot of praise, a little tidbit of heaven, I think, as we all joined together, not mattering what denomination or color of skin or anything. It was wonderful. But it was all to praise God. And then from 1 Thessalonians, be joyful always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. I believe with all my heart that first and foremost we are to give thanks to God before we do anything else. Thanksgiving and praise should be at the beginning of all of our prayers. It's what came first in the model prayer that Jesus gave to us. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, which simply means praise be or thanks be to thy name. And not only should we start each prayer with thanksgiving, but we should also start each new day with thanksgiving. Try this tomorrow morning. And I know it's hard because it's a Monday. But try this tomorrow morning. As soon as your eyes are open, before you put your feet on the floor, assuming that your eyes open, before you put your feet on the floor, as soon as you come to consciousness tomorrow, say this, thank you, God, for watching over me last night. Thank you, God, that you gave me another day on this earth. Thank you, God, that I'm breathing. Thank you, God, that I can stand up. I mean, anything, just Thank you, God, for this brand new day. And even if you didn't have a great night of sleep, 
which happens frequently for some of us, you can still thank God that the night is through and the new day has dawned. There's always something to thank God for, and if we would start our day with thanksgiving, I have a funny feeling that the rest of the day would go a lot better. We should give thanks to God in all things, and we should do it joyfully. Now, I know that sometimes we feel as though our lives are in shambles. Sometimes we feel like everything is falling apart. Our lives are, are crowded with worries and problems. Now, let me tell you, giving thanks does not make these problems go away. But giving thanks helps us face and deal with these problems in a more positive and productive way. Giving thanks to God in all circumstances can do two things. First, it takes our eyes off of our problems. And secondly, it puts our eyes on Jesus, on God, who has the power to help us through our problems. So give thanks. Start each new day. Begin each new task. Face each new problem with thanksgiving. And if you think you don't have anything to be thankful for, listen to this little prayer that I found. Lord, I give thanks for the sink full of dirty dishes because it means my family has had food to eat. I give thanks for the pile of dirty laundry because it means that my family has had clothes to wear. I give thanks for the unmade beds because it means that we've had what so many don't have each night, a bed to sleep in. I give thanks for the slamming of the screen door because it means that my children are healthy enough to run and play. Lord, the presence of all these chores awaiting me says that you have richly blessed my family. I shall do them cheerfully, and I shall do them gratefully. If you don't think you have anything to be thankful for, we do. It helps us face each new day, but it all, giving thanks also helps us to face the people, to interact in positive ways with the people that we come in contact with. Several years ago, and you might remember this, there was a series of TV commercials out that were all around the word thanks. And this one in particular I remember was where a woman goes up to a rather large woman in the grocery store and asks her when her baby is due. Don't ever do that. A larger woman replied very angrily, I'm not pregnant. The older woman was dumbfounded for a moment and didn't really know what else to say until finally she just says, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and it shows them, it shows this other woman not knowing what to do except laugh. <laughs> and suddenly the tension was broken and the commercial ends with it's amazing what the word thanks can do. And it is. Giving thanks can help us with all of life. Joyfully give thanks. That's the first instruction that we find for our school of life. But there's more. The second instruction is found in verse 11. <clears throat> Listen to these words. Being strengthened with all power according to his glorious might so that you may have great endurance and patience. You see, once we give thanks to God and our focus is on God, then we can move to this second instruction, and that is to lean on God's strength and power. We don't have to do anything alone. Why do we try? We don't have to do anything without God's help. God, amazingly, this powerful and wonderful God amazingly desires to help us do whatever we have to do. Listen to his words from 2 Corinthians chapter, uh, verse, chapter 12, verse 9. These are some of my favorite words from Scripture. It says, and this is God speaking, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. In other words, when we are weak, he is strong. When we are weak and go to God for help, that's when God's power is demonstrated the most. I'm certain that as we all begin a new school year, because let's face it, most of us are parents or grandparents sending kids off, there will be challenges this year. Some of them will seem overwhelming. Some of them will seem difficult. But God's word assures us that if we will allow him to, God will provide his strength and his power to accomplish even the impossible. 
Some of you are old enough, like me, to remember Joni Erickson. She was injured as a teenager uh, in a diving accident that left her paralyzed from the neck down. Now, in the years that followed, she had a, a long road of rehabilitation and adjusting to life. And during this time, Joni discovered that her faith in God was crucial to her survival. Now, she was interviewed, and here's another old name, too. She was interviewed by Larry King one time, and he asked her this question. He said, don't you ever grow discouraged or frustrated? And I love her answer. Listen. She says, oh, yes. There are many mornings when I wake up, and I'm lying there waiting for someone to come and get me out of bed. Hey, we have something to be thankful for, don't we? She says, I wonder how in the world am I going to do it for another day? How am I going to smile at the people who wait on me hand and foot? How am I going to make it through another day? I'm so tired, I just don't know if I can do it again today. And then she says, I pray this prayer. It's so simple. Oh God, I'm so tired and weak, but I give thanks that you are not. You are strong, so can I borrow your strength? For today can I borrow your strength for today that is beautiful now Joni was able to pray that prayer because undoubtedly she had oftentimes given thanks to God through the years for all the powerful and wonderful things that he had done which would remind her that he is strong enough to let her use some of his strength for the day and we need to do that too. When we face the challenges and the difficulties and what seems like impossible tasks, then we just need to ask God if we can borrow some of his strength. And you know what? He will gladly lend it to us. Now, having given thanks and having recognized that God is with us and will strengthen us, we are then instructed with our third instruction to bear fruit for Christ, or that is to go out and live for him. Verse 10 gives us this instruction. It says, We pray this in order that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and may please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work and growing in the knowledge of God. Live for Jesus. Live to please Jesus. I know we may have seemed a little corny when some of us wore those bracelets, WWJD, what would Jesus do? But there's something to that to ask us to remember what would Jesus want us to do? What would he have done? Because we need to just follow in his footsteps. Bear fruit for him. Now, what does this fruit look like? Well, we get it in another one of Paul's letters, one of our Sunday school classes, children's Sunday school classes. We're studying this this morning. We call it the fruits of the Spirit. It's found in Galatians. You know what they are? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and the hardest one of all, self-control. These are the things that we should be practicing every day, and if we, will make it, if we will make it a top priority to practice these fruits of the Spirit, to practice all of these things, then we will be living for Jesus. We will be bearing his fruit. And when these fruits, and you know that's what when you talk about the fruit on a tree, you know what kind of a tree it is by the fruit it bears. We want people to know who we are by the fruit that we bear. And when people see our fruit, then it can be one of the best ways to bring evangelism into this world. Let me tell you a story about a girl from the country of Borneo. Her grandfather had been a headhunter who did not believe in God at all. Well, one night this girl, went when she was in high school, she went to a... Uh, a youth program that happened to be led by some Methodist missionaries that were there. And that night she was converted. She accepted Christ as her savior and she dedicated her life to him, but she had a problem. How would she tell her parents and her family who didn't believe in God about her newfound faith? Well, she decided not to tell them in words, but in deeds, through actions. And listen to what she says happened. Before Christ came into my life, I was spoiled and selfish. I was irritable and impatient. I was disrespectful to my parents. My room was a mess and my attitude was worse. But after Christ came into my life, I changed. 
I was kind to my parents. I cleaned my room without being told. I helped with the housework without being asked. I spoke with tenderness and respect to my parents. I was loving toward others. My parents noticed and said to me, daughter, you are different. Why? What happened to you? And I said to them, yes, I am different. I have been reborn. I have Christ as my savior. I am a Christian now, and this is the way that Christians are supposed to live. And then, here's the miracle. Her parents said, tell us more about this religion. Tell us more about this Jesus. If he can change people like that, then we want to be Christians too. That is bearing fruit for Christ. And that's what we are to do every day as we begin, first of all, by giving thanks. As secondly, we allow God's strength to get us through the rough times because you know people are watching us and watching how we handle the difficult times of our lives. That is a witness for Christ. And then finally, as we make it our top priority to be loving and kind and patient and good to all those we come in contact with. If we will do this, others will see they will see Jesus in us and maybe, just maybe, come to know Jesus through us. These are the instructions that we have for the school of life. Now, the key to all of this is prayer. Paul's words to the Colossians were, were encased in a prayer for them. He prayed that they would joyfully give thanks. He prayed that they would lean on God's strength, and he prayed that they would bear fruit for Christ in all that they did. And that is our challenge for today as a community of faith. We prayed for these kids and these school staff today, but we don't want to stop. They need it tomorrow and every day through the year. And they're not the only ones who need it. We all need to pray for one another that we will give thanks, that we will lean on God's strength, and that we will bear fruit for him. Now let me close with one more story. Several years ago in a mining town in West Virginia, a 17-year-old boy took a summer job in, in a coal mine. Now being a coal miner for the summer sounded adventuresome and macho to him. But the second week while he was on the job, he got lost in one of the mines. He'd been working with a group of veteran miners who told him very explicitly, don't stray from where we are. Don't get away from us. Stay close by to us because these mines, you can get lost in, in a heartbeat. But he didn't listen to them. And so he absentmindedly wandered away from the work team and he became completely lost. He yelled for help, but he was beyond the earshot of the other miners. They did not hear him. And then to make matters worse, his only light, his only flashlight that he had went out. Now, in total darkness, he was absolutely terrified. He was just certain that he was going to die down there all alone. And so he dropped to his knees and he prayed a simple prayer, God, help me. And he says as he was kneeling there in prayer, he felt his knee touching something hard. And he realized as he put his hand down there that it was a railroad track. And he thought to himself, if this is a railroad track, that means it probably leads out of this mine. If I just crawl along and follow this track, it will lead me to safety. And it did. This is our track. And if we will cling to it, read it, study it, ponder it, meditate on it, ask God to show us through it, we can be led safely through any dark place, any dark day, any bright day, every day. Because truly, thy word, O Lord, is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thanks be to God. Amen.